So about a year ago, I got the chance of an opportunity of a lifetime to work in a university laboratory as a high school student. But the problem was, I didn't actually have an idea of what I wanted to do inside this lab. And all right, it seems like something you should probably figure out before you even apply. But that wasn't the case. But whatever, it's OK. I'll just come up with one. How hard could it be? Well, as it turns out, coming up with a research idea is a lot harder than you might think. And so today, I'm going to guide you through the process of how I created my idea so that your journey of innovation might be a lot smoother. So let's get into what my project exactly is. My project at the University of Alberta was to uh, try and create something that could detect new ice nucleating agents. But Jesse, what are ice nucleating agents? Well, to answer your question, I need to first explain a scientific principle called water supercooling. Now, it's a widely known fact that what the freezing point of water has a freezing point of zero degrees. However, it's a less known fact that water can actually remain liquid up until negative 38 degrees Celsius without freezing solid. And I, a concept called water supercooling, which is super cool. Right, get it? <laughs> Anyways, so there's a catch though. The water has to be 100% pure, it has to be just H2O. We can't ha actually have any contaminants in it. And I'll get to why this is in a minute. But why is supercooling important? How can we harness this principle to benefit us? Well, as it turns out, certain particles can actually cause water to freeze at much higher temperatures than that negative 38 degree mark, such as negative four degrees. And these particles are called ice nucleating particles. Nucleation as in the in particles act as a nucleus for the water to form around. And these particles can exist as pollen, volcanic ash, or even certain proteins that bacteria make. But how can we use this to our advantage? What is the point of ice nucleating particles? And why is your talk called how we can make it rain with science? Well, as it turns out, clouds are actually giant blobs of super cooled water in the air. So if we disperse these ice nucleating particles in it, we can actually cause the water in these clouds to aggregate and freeze. And now that it's frozen, it'll become too heavy to stay in the sky and will actually just fall down back to the earth, creating what we know as rain. But currently, this procedure is called cloud seeding. But we, uh, the current particle we use for it is a chemical called silver iodide. And there are two problems with this chemical. One, it's been shown to be a bit carcinogenic to humans. And two, there are other ice nucleating particles that are more effective than this. But how can we find these ice nucleating particles that are better than silver iodide? And that's where my project comes in today. So my project uses a simple idea, the difference between densities of water and ice. We all know that ice is less dense than water, and that's why the ice cubes float on top of the McDonald's soda drink that you order. But, and this method uses the, that concept to our advantage. Essentially, in a cuvette, which is sort of like a rectangular prism, like test tube in the lab, I would fill it with an oil that has a density between that of water and ice, so that when we drop water into it, it'll sink right down to the bottom. But if we have ice in it, well, it'll actually float right up to the top. So if we create micro droplets of a solution with with and without ice nucleating agents, and we put them both inside this cuvette, and we put this cuvette in a freezer, we'll actually see that the droplet with the ice nucleating agents inside freeze much faster than the ones that don't have ice nucleating agents. So the neon yellow droplets have ice nucleating agents mixed inside, and the purple ones do not. And here's actually a video of it working inside the freezer. You can actually see the yellow particles or droplets freeze, and then they go straight up to the top. And using this method, which is extremely simple, we can actually detect which ice nucleating particle is better than another, and we can replace silver iodide. So this method worked great, but it wasn't perfect. It still wasn't fast enough. It took me hours in the lab to set this all up, and I kept spilling the samples, so I have to restart over and over again. So how can we actually fix this? And the uh, time that, I mean, the step that took the most time was actually creating the micro droplets because we needed those to sample. And I used another simple idea. 
Have you ever shaken a water bottle with air, like some amount of air at the top and a lot of water? And when you do so, you actually have the air sort of turn into bubbles inside the water. Of course, it disappears really quickly because air is a gas. But if you do the same experiment with oil and water, we can actually see if there's more oil in, uh, than there is no water inside the bottle, we can actually see the water form droplets. Of course, these droplets won't be equally sized because the power you're using to shake the bottle isn't consistent each time. But if we do this in a lab, we can actually control the volume of these droplets and to create perfect one microliter sized droplets each time. So that's, those are pictures of one time where I just sh shook the bottle and then we could create equally sized droplets. And they're pretty consistently sized. And we could do this really, really quickly. So let's get back to the main thing I wanted to talk about today. So the actual idea making process. How did I come up with these? And more importantly, why the heck did you choose ice nucleation as a research project when none of us have actually even heard of this concept before? And the reason is pretty simple. And my, as my professor likes to put it, Cancer and Alzheimer's disease are these sexy sciences, and everybody wants to get into them. So there's a lot of people trying to solve those problems, but that leaves no one else to solve the problems that we all have other than Alzheimer's and cancer. So from the way I see it, there are two main types of ideas, or two main types of goals. Grand goals, grand ideas, or niche goals. Now, what do I mean when I talk about grand goals? These ones are the ones that talk about or target huge diseases like cancer, Alzheimer's, or huge problems like world hunger. And that's great. We, we need solutions to these problems. But they often take years and a long time to solve to get to something that's actually good. Chemotherapy began in 1925, but after a whopping 21 years, it finally entered clinical trials. So instead, some of us should uh, focus on the niche ideas as well. And I'm not trying to discourage you from uh, pursuing your dreams and curing cancer, because we need those, these types of people in the world. But just know that there are other niche areas that also need your help. So what do I mean by a niche idea? The niche idea focuses mainly on application. Now, we don't actually need like a new scientific concept to be invented, we can rely on existing scientific concepts and combine them to create something new. For example, in this project, I didn't uh, use some new scientific concept that I invented. I just simply used the densities of water and ice and how oil and water doesn't mix. Very simple. And that leads me to my second piece of advice for coming up with ideas. And it goes by a simple acronym, KISS. And this stands for Keep It Simple Stupid. And now you don't actually have to be stupid for this to work, but you have to do, uh, keep it simple. Simple ideas are easier to market, easier to explain, easier to come up with. And uh, well, we don't really need for complex uh, problems, we don't need complex solutions, when in fact a simple and elegant simple solution would work just as well. Simple ideas, when they fit and they solve a complex problem, fits together like a jigsaw puzzle. And there's a certain beauty to it when you come up with something like that. So that leads me to my third piece of advice. And it's related to the most important part of an idea. And that's the first spark. Where do you actually get the inspiration for these ideas? And for me, that's everywhere, in nature, in my everyday life. And when coming up with this project, how I actually came up with a droplet making idea is when I was cooking pierogies in the kitchen. I mixed some, uh, together some oil and water in the pan. I'm not exactly sure if that's how you're supposed to cook pierogies, but that's the way how I do it. But I noticed that the oil and water didn't mix, and they formed droplets, and they stayed droplets. So then I took that idea, and I applied it in the lab. So, Every day, everywhere around us, we see these scientific principles, but we often brush, brush it off as just something that happens and insignificant. But it is our job to take these scientific principles and make them significant by applying them in ways that we don't actually normally think about. So, just as I once thought that mixing oil and water was completely useless, it has changed this project forever, and it has changed my life forever. Thank you very much.